To really understand the behaviour of systems at equilibrium, we're going to have to take a look at Le Chatelier's principle. And nope, this is not French 101, still HSE chemistry, trust me. Hi, I'm Dr Nikhil Vassan, Academic Director at Talent 100. In this episode of our HSC Chemistry Talent Teaching Series, we're going to be looking at Le Chatelier's Principle, which is the most thorough treatment of qualitative equilibrium behaviour. And it's going to find its way into a lot of the answers you're going to write in your HSC exams. This forms an important part of Module 5, Equilibrium and Acid Reactions. Let's check it out. So the most important rule when it comes to equilibrium is Le Chatelier's Principle. So this is going to essentially drive 90% of the questions you're going to get on equilibrium. So it's really crucial that you understand the mechanics of how this one works. So Le Chatelier's principle is a chemical definition of something that we broadly see in a lot of aspects of science. And this is called negative feedback. All right, negative feedback. So negative feedback is basically the idea that if you have some sort of system and you poke and prod at it, all right? If you uh, disturb that system in some way, then it's going to counteract what you've done to it, all right? And this is something we see everywhere in the world, all right? If you change something in a way, it will sort of try and bring itself back to where it was. Um, and it's the reason it's called negative feedback is you apply a change and it opposes you, it tries to negate your change. And that's the opposite of positive feedback, where if you you know, poke and prod at something, if you change something, it then amplifies what you've done. Um, and there's very few systems that work like that. So most things in science and in the world are negative feedback to try and regroup at some order again. Now, we can provide a word definition for negative feedback in chemistry, and this is the word definition that you've got to quote all the time in your answers to questions. So it's crucial that you get this wording right. So what we can say about Le Chatelier's principle is that when a system at equilibrium, so that's important, um, it only works at equilibrium. So when a system at equilibrium is disturbed, So in other words, um, if we have a closed system at equilibrium and then we suddenly open it and we make some sort of change to it, all right? or we can keep it closed but change the amount of energy in the system. So when we do any of those things, then the system will adjust itself. So then the system adjusts itself. And this is the crucial aspect that links back to negative feedback. So the system adjusts itself to minimize, very important, minimize the disturbance. So if ever you're asked to define Le Chatelier's principle, you can write it like this, okay? And this pretty much encapsulates the key aspects of what we're gonna look at in uh, more detail in reactions. So once again, when a system at equilibrium, so it's only defined at equilibrium, is disturbed, in other words, you open the system and change the content, or you change the amount of energy in the system, then the system adjusts itself. In other words, it will change the position of equilibrium to minimize the disturbance, okay? In order to counteract the change that you've done to the system. So that's the definition of it. Let's now look at it in more detail in a chemical reaction. So I think you know where I'm gonna go with this. All right, I'm gonna put an equilibrium reaction on the board and you guessed it, it's gonna be the Haber process. So I'm gonna put a nitrogen back up. I'm gonna put hydrogen back up, a reversible arrow and ammonia. Okay. Now, I'm also going to introduce one more aspect into this equation that I didn't have before, and that's the enthalpy of the equation. So I'm also going to write down that delta H, or the enthalpy change, is less than zero. So if you remember back to looking at um, energy profile diagrams, delta H less than zero means that heat is released in this reaction, so it's an exothermic reaction. Another way you can write that instead of writing this is you can just write plus heat. Okay, it's not as technical a way of writing it, but it illustrates the same point. There's another thing I'm going to write here, which is something on top of the arrow, and that's Fe3O4. Okay, now Fe3O4, you might be saying, hang on, that's not a real compound, and you're right, it's actually a mix of FeO and Fe2O3. So if you add them together, you get this, all right? Um, so it's iron 2 and iron 3 oxide. The word for this is magnetite. And 
remember the thing that goes above the arrow is the catalyst. Okay, so I've introduced a couple of new things into the Haber process, a catalyst and an enthalpy change. And this is going to be important when we're looking at how Le Chatelier's principle works here. All right, so what I want you to imagine is that I've put a bunch of nitrogen and hydrogen and the catalyst into a reaction chamber. I've you know, walked away for a bit and I've come back and it's now attained equilibrium. There is a certain amount of nitrogen and hydrogen and ammonia in here and they're reacting at uh, the forward and backward reaction are at equal rates. So when I have a look at the box, nothing appears to be changing. Okay, so I'm at equilibrium. Now, I'm going to look at disturbing this equilibrium and assessing how this reaction will change. Okay, so we're going to look at four main aspects that we can alter in this reaction that causes an equilibrium change. And the first one we're going to look at is temperature. So how does temperature change affect the position of equilibrium? And temperature change is all to do with the enthalpy of the reaction. So this reaction is exothermic, which means that as you go forward, it produces heat. In other words, it warms up the environment, okay? And the opposite of this, as the reaction goes backwards, it's endothermic, it works oppositely. So this is always defined for the forward reaction. So if you run the backward reaction, it's going to consume heat, and in other words, it's going to cool down the environment. So how does a temperature change affect this equilibrium? So again, I want you to imagine that the system is really happy, it's balanced, it does not want to be disturbed, and then I come along and I do something to the temperature. So let's look at two things we can do. So the first thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to try heating it up. Okay, so if I heat up this reaction, what's going to happen? So I want you to think about heating it up as me adding energy into this reaction. And if it's exothermic, okay, I can write that there's plus heat here. So it's like I'm adding a product into the reaction. Okay, I know it's a bit of a stretch there, but heating it up is like adding a product into the reaction because heat can be considered as a product in an exothermic reaction. So Remember how I talked about before that the rate of the backward reaction increases as you have more product available. And that's because of these collisions going on between the molecules. So it follows that if I add a product to this reaction, I'm increasing the amount of stuff on the right hand side. Now that is going to drive the backward reaction more. Okay, there's more stuff on this side and therefore there's more reaction on that side. So what that means is from a balanced state, I've suddenly made the reaction react more backwards. Okay, and so what you can imagine here is that some of the ammonia is going to push back and react into this stuff. All right? Or you can think about that as it's consuming the extra heat I've put in and it's going to attain a new equilibrium. But the point of equilibrium here is going to be more to the left. So if I draw that scale again, so here's the scale of equilibrium that I had before. So if we imagine that initially the scale was somewhere here, okay, it's going to move this way, all right, to the left. So this was initial and this was after heating, okay? Now we can look at the opposite situation here. What happens if I cool it down? All right, so I can say here that it moves to the left if you hear it. So if you cool it down, the opposite is going to happen. Think about cooling down the system as me removing heat from the system. So I'm actually reducing the stuff on the right hand side. So before the forward and backward reactions were at equal rates, but now I'm taking stuff out from the right hand side. So there's less reaction potential here, but there's still the same amount on this side. So this now has less to push against. So it's going to push more and more forward and it's going to produce more of that heat that I've taken away until it attains a new point of equilibrium. So if I cool down this reaction, then it's going to move to the right somewhere. So this is going to be cooling. And that's going to be the new point of equilibrium. So I can say here that cooling is going to move it to the right. Okay, so we can see how in this exothermic reaction, heating it up is going to push it backwards or to the left because I'm essentially adding more stuff on the right hand side and cooling is going to push it forwards or to the right because I'm essentially getting rid of stuff on the right hand side. 
Now, the important thing to remember here is that if this was a different equilibrium reaction that was endothermic, in other words, the forward reaction consumed heat, these two are going to work oppositely. Okay, so in an endothermic reaction, heating it pushes it forward and cooling it pulls it backwards. So the next aspect we're going to look at is pressure and volume. And I'm going to link the two together because they do kind of work together. Um, pressure and volume can be considered the inverse of each other. So if I increase the pressure in a system, I'm, I'm decreasing the volume. And if I um, increase the volume in a system, I'm decreasing the pressure. So you can just think of them as opposite changes to each other. Um, now, how does the pressure of a system affect equilibrium? So the first thing to, um, to note here is that pressure and volume only affect the position of equilibrium when there are gases involved. Um, and that's because um, aqueous solutions, which are the other things that are um, involved with equilibrium, they don't really respond to, to pressure and volume the same way that gases do. It's primarily a gas concept. But lucky for us, we have an equilibrium here which has all gases in it. So this is going to be very important to us. Now, how is this system affected? Okay, so the first thing to, to look at here is just remind ourselves what pressure is. So remember, pressure is uh, defined as a force per unit area. So if you imagine a box, okay, and we can think of this box as the box where this reaction is taking place, and we have all these molecules inside. All right, so ammonia, hydrogen, nitrogen, all of these molecules inside. These gases are smacking the walls of the chamber. So they're moving in random directions. They're hitting each other. They're hitting the walls. And each time they hit the walls of the chamber, they're applying a force. And the greater that force is, the greater the pressure. So you can imagine that if you sort of squish this in, or if you increase the energy of the molecules, you're going to be increasing the pressure inside this box. And similarly, if you sort of stretch the box out, then the molecules will hit the sides less because they're further away with less energy and that pressure is going to drop. So that's why pressure and volume are sort of inverses of each other. So that's what pressure is, all right? The smacking of the molecules into the sides of the chamber. Now, um, what happens if we increase the pressure in this particular example? <clears throat> so increasing the pressure, remember, is like decreasing the volume. So I'm going to say increase pressure and also decrease volume. And we'll just take this as one point, OK? So what, what's going to happen here? Well, let's think of what happens when we squash down this box, OK? And we make it into a tiny, tiny, tiny box. Now, if I squish this chamber down, I'm not really changing the amount of molecules in there. I'm just giving them less space to do things. So I'm squishing it down. That's not reducing the amount of stuff, OK? Instead, I'm putting a lot of stress on all the molecules in there. I'm increasing the pressure and they don't like that because they were at equilibrium before and they want to go back to equilibrium. So what's the best way for this reaction to then get rid of my change? So I'm squashing everything in here and suddenly there, the reaction wants there to be less stuff. And the best way that the reaction can get less stuff in the box is by reacting more towards the side with less molecules. Okay, so let's have a look here. The left hand side of this reaction has four gas molecules. So it has one nitrogen and four hyd uh, sorry, three hydrogens. Together that makes four gas molecules. And on this side, we just have the two ammonia molecules. Okay, um, so four on the left, two on the right. So if I squish everything down, it's going to force this side into here. And that's the reaction's way of trying to equalize the pressure again. Because the less stuff you have in the smaller area, the more it's back to normal again. Okay? And so if I increase the pressure, it's going to favor the side with less gas moles. Okay? Now, depending on what the equilibrium is, that could be forwards or backwards. Okay? But in this particular example, it's going to be the forward reaction. All right, because that has two gas moles in it. And the opposite is also true. So what happens if I decrease the pressure or increase the volume? OK, so imagine that I get this box that's very, very happily at equilibrium, and I stretch the side of the box to make a gigantic chamber. All of a sudden, there's a bunch of empty space that's going to drop the pressure of the system. And the system is not happy with that because I've changed it at equilibrium. So what does it want to do? There's a lot of empty space that it wants to fill up. 
So it's going to try and create more molecules. And the best way of creating the molecules and filling up the space is to move to the side with more gas moles. So decreasing the pressure is going to move to the side with more gas moles. And again, it's going to depend on what the equilibrium is. But in the Haber process, that's going to involve moving it backwards. Okay, so if you decrease the pressure of this reaction, it's going to favor the left hand side or it's going to favor the reverse reaction. So that's how pressure and volume works. I'll just delineate this to make it easier. Okay, so that's how pressure and volume works in the system. Now, um, there's one more thing that we should talk about for pressure and volume. And uh, I'll just quickly grab this um, and um, show you another reaction. So I'll put this one back up on the board a bit later. But there's another reaction that's, a, that's useful to look at pressure and volume. And that's the, the, um, the uh, water gas shift equation. Okay? So this is an equation that produces hydrogen gas. Um, and it looks like this. So we have carbon monoxide reacting with water. And this forms an equilibrium with carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas. It's actually a really useful industrial way in which we can produce hydrogen, which is quite a rare commodity on Earth. Um, so this is another equilibrium reaction that involves gases. But this is a really good example of how you can get tricked in questions. So they put this equation up in the question and you know it looks very normal, a nice equilibrium involving gases. And then they ask you about changing the pressure. So they say, what happens in this equilibrium if I double the pressure of the system or if I increase the pressure of the system? So it's tempting if you're used to the Haber process to say, oh, increasing pressure shifts to the right. But that's not how it works in all equilibrium reactions. Instead of saying right or left, the first thing you have to look at is which side has less gas moles. Now let's have a look at this reaction. We have one mole of carbon monoxide and one mole of water on the left. That's a total of two. And on the right we have one mole of carbon dioxide and one mole of hydrogen. That's also two. So we have two gas moles on the left and two on the right. That means no side has more or less gas moles. So if you change the pressure or the volume of this particular reaction, it actually doesn't affect the point of equilibrium. And that's because there's no way for the system to react to your change. There's no way for it to increase or decrease the amount of gas moles, because whichever way it moves, that number doesn't change. So in these particular examples, and there's a few more that you'll encounter, the answer to pressure and volume changes by Le Chatelier's principle is that the system doesn't adjust to account for your change because it doesn't have the capacity to. The third factor in Le Chatelier's principle is concentration. So concentration refers to the amount of a given substance in the particular volume of the chamber. Okay? So once again, I have my reaction chamber and I have a bunch of gas molecules flying around. And concentration simply means if I added more nitrogen in here, then there's more nitrogen in this volume and that's an increased concentration. Or if I remove ammonia, then that's like decreasing the concentration. I have less ammonia in a given volume. So concentration tends to be measured in the units moles per liter. Okay? Now, how does concentration affect the position of equilibrium by Le Chatelier's principle? So once again, this all comes back down to reaction rates. So right, how does my disturbance affect the forward and backward reaction in a way that it adjusts itself? So um, let's look at increasing concentration first. All right, so what happens if I increase the concentration? So let's take, for example, nitrogen, okay? I'm going to um, open up this chamber, which was very, very happily at equilibrium. It doesn't want to be disturbed. And I'm going to pour a bunch of nitrogen gas into it and then seal it up again. So essentially what I've done is I've just very abruptly increased the concentration of one of the reactants or one of the left-hand side molecules. And think about reaction rates again, all right? Reaction rates all are determined by the amount of collisions going on. And if I have more stuff on the left-hand side, it's going to favor the reaction that pushes forward, okay? So it wasn't balanced before, but now it's gonna move more to the right, okay? So increasing concentration favors the, um, well, it favors the, the reaction that moves it away from that side, okay? So it's gonna favor, the other side. 
And the reason I write the other side is because you can also look at increasing the amount of ammonia. So if I opened the chamber and dumped a bunch of ammonia in and then closed it, well, it's going to favor the reaction moving this way for the exact same reason. The backward reaction now gets pushed more than the forward reaction. So that's why I've written it favors the other side. You increase the left-hand side, it favors moving right. You increase the right-hand side, it favors moving left. And um, you could probably see where this is going now based on the other two, but if I decrease the concentration, it's going to have the exact opposite effect. Okay, so if I removed nitrogen from this chamber, now that's going to be a bit difficult, but let's say that I had a way of doing it. Okay, I open this chamber up and I just suck up a bunch of the nitrogen and then close it again. Well, now there's a massive deficiency in the nitrogen and there's less reaction occurring on this side. So that means that the backward reaction now gains a lot of traction and it pushes more towards the left. Okay, so I remove nitrogen, I decrease its concentration, and it favors the production of this again. All right? Think of it as it's trying to replenish the nitrogen that you've removed from it. Remember, the system always acts to minimize your disturbance. So if you've removed it, it wants to create it again. And you can use the same argument for ammonia. And this one actually makes a lot more sense uh, from a chemical perspective, uh, because the Haber process is actually involved with synthesizing ammonia. So Ammonia is a polar molecule compared to these two. So if you actually cool the chamber, you can liquefy and remove it. So it's actually quite easy to remove ammonia from the system and it happens in real life. So if I decide to just liquefy this ammonia and remove it from the system very abruptly, suddenly this system which was at equilibrium now has nothing on the right hand side. It's almost like the equation is starting fresh. Okay, you've got a bunch of nitrogen and hydrogen that are still there from equilibrium. And I've just removed everything on the right hand side. So what happens? Well, now we have a forward reaction that's unopposed. All right? There's now nothing on this side that can react backwards. So the reaction pushes forwards again until it creates more ammonia and gets to a point where it forms a new equilibrium. And of course, that point of equilibrium is going to be much more forward than it was before because you have more of the reactants that are moving to the right hand side. So if you remove ammonia from the reaction, you're pushing forward. If you remove nitrogen from the reaction, you're pushing backwards. So we can summarize that by saying that if you decrease the concentration of anything here, you're favoring the same side. In other words, the reaction moves to create the, the substance that you have removed from the, the reaction chamber. Okay, so uh, we can look at concentration in these two ways and how it relates to the rate of reaction. So the last thing we're going to talk about in Le Chatelier's principle is the effect of a catalyst. So remember, a catalyst is a substance that doesn't actually participate in the chemical reaction itself, but it helps in some way by increasing the reaction rate. And remember, the way it does this is by decreasing the activation energy of the reaction, or that initial energy that needs to be surmounted before that reaction can take place. And the catalyst in the Haber process is this thing here, which is a magnetite, a mix of iron-2 and iron-3 oxide. So how does a catalyst affect the position of equilibrium? So let's, let's put the scale back up here. Okay, so remember this is 100% uh, reactants or left-hand side and 100% products are right-hand side. And hypothetically, I'm just gonna say that the Haber process lies somewhere here. Okay, so remember, what defines the point of equilibrium? It's the point at which the forward rate and the backward rate are equal in magnitude. Okay, so you have the, the same rate of formation and being used up of everything here. Okay, so macroscopically nothing is changing. So that's the definition of this point. So based on that definition, we can think about what a catalyst is going to do. So a catalyst increases the rate of reaction. But there are two reactions here, a forward and a backward. And the important thing to remember here is that a catalyst increases both of those rates. Okay, so if the system was at equilibrium before and I now introduce a catalyst into the system, this rate is going to be increased and this rate is going to be increased. And they're going to be increased at the same amount because the catalyst has the same effect on every single substance here. So if the rates of reaction were equal before and you increase them by the same amount, they're still equal. All right, it's like I'm just having a bigger arrow. Okay. So there's still equal rates of reaction, and that means that there is still no change forwards or backwards. 
Okay, all it means is that the rate at which these things are being turned over is now greater. Okay, but the relative amounts of them are still going to remain exactly the same. So there's a bit of a trick to the catalyst, and the answer is that it doesn't affect it doesn't affect the equilibrium position. Okay, so that's really crucial. Um, so you might ask yourself, well, why do we bother using the catalyst then? Right? If the if the point of the Haber process, if I'm a you know a chemist who's running an industrial plant, if the if the point of this is to create ammonia. What's the point of using a catalyst if it doesn't push the reaction towards producing ammonia? But the important thing to remember is that it still increases the rate of reaction. So it increases the rate. Now what that means is if I had the catalyst to begin with and I dump my nitrogen and hydrogen into the system, it moves from this point to that point really quickly. It moves there quicker than it would without the catalyst. So it increases the speed at which I can produce my ammonia, but it doesn't actually push the point forward in the reaction where there's more ammonia in the chamber. So it allows me to do the reaction faster, but it doesn't actually move me to a point where there's more overall ammonia. So it still helps in terms of, a, if you look at an industrial production of this thing, it still helps by making it produce faster, but doesn't give you more of it in the reaction chamber. So that's a crucial thing about the catalyst. It's always a trick question that comes up. You know, by Le Chatelier's principle, how does the catalyst affect the position of equilibrium? And you've got to say, well, the catalyst increases the forward and backward rate equally. And seeing as they were equal before at equilibrium, there's now no change in equilibrium, okay? But you might see the question phrased a different way. Instead of saying, how does the catalyst affect the position of equilibrium, to which the answer is it doesn't, you might see the question saying, how does the catalyst affect an equilibrium reaction? Now that's a broader question. So then you've got to address both of these points. You've got to say, well, in the equilibrium, we talk about a position of equilibrium, and we talk about how quickly that position is attained. And the catalyst does not affect the position itself, but it does actually increase the rate at which that position is attained. So the catalyst does not affect this particular position. Thanks for watching. But remember, this is just a really small section of a huge course. So if you want to be a real master of HSC chemistry, make sure you check out the links below and see how you can sign up to a free trial today. I'm Dr. Nikhil Vasan. Thanks for watching. See you next time.